As I was researching Timothy Hopkins for this talk, I was surprised by how much I really didn't know about him, or how much I thought I knew, but I was mistaken. In my 30 year plus researching local peninsula history, I've never come across such misinformation about one person, especially when you consider the person and his time. One might understand a man of mystery had he lived in a time or place where there was few reliable sources of information. And so if, you know, if we could understand if he had been uh, maybe undercover or in a covert operative, or if he had been a criminal, but um, Timothy Hopkins was in California for the last 40 years of the 19th century and the first 35 years of the 20th century, and he was a very visible businessman and community leader. His good life, his, his good life and his good deeds were widely reported in the lo local newspapers throughout his long life. He was a major presence in Menlo Park, a community where, with his largest state and business enterprise, the Sunset Nursery and Seed Company. He has been called the father of Palo Alto, rightfully so, since he bought the land, plotted the town, and named the streets, and sold the lots to the first residents and business people. But most significantly, he was Stanford University's godfather. Jane and Leland Stanford gave birth to the university, but it was Timothy Hopkins as one of the original trustees who oversaw the development in its first 50 years with his time, his energy, and his significant financial resources. He uh, would be expected to be called a godfather, whether of a child, a mafia family, or of a brand new educational enterprise. Timothy Hopkins was born Timothy Nolan in 1859, the son of Patrick and Caroline Nolan, Irish immigrants living in Maine. His father came to California in the early 1860s, lured by stories of gold, but he was a bit late for that. But he found employment on the San Francisco waterfront and sent for his family. For years, I've been reporting that story that I learned that Patrick Nolan drowned in the San Francisco Bay as the ship carrying his family approached the dock. In his excitement to see his family, he jumped into the bay and then realized that he did not know how to swim. It's a great story, but it's not accurate. He did drown in the bay, but he, uh, it was several weeks prior to their arrival, just about the time that they were leaving New York in 1862. The story goes on that Caroline Nolan, now widowed with a small child, travels to Sacramento and finds employment with Mark and Mary Hopkins, the childless couple and business associate of Leland Stanford. Many of us are familiar with the story of Timothy Nolan moving into the Hopkins home, assuming the persona of their son, and even taking the Hopkins name. The real story of the Nolan family has been uncovered using information not readily available to researchers 30, 40, or 50 years ago, but now easily searchable through electronic uh, newspaper databases, we can find more of this story. Patrick Nolan did come to California in her early 1862 to seek a better life for his growing family. Finding work in San Francisco, he sent for his wife and children. He drowned as his wife and children boarded a ship in New York. Having traveled from Maine to New York, um, and I said children, because she left Maine with her two sons and a newborn daughter. Timothy Hopkins had an older brother, Thomas, who was three years older than he was, and a sister, Margaret, who was born just prior to their departure from Maine. Margaret fell ill and died on the third day of their voyage and was buried at sea. Catherine and her two sons completed the journey, crossed Panama, and sailed into San Francisco Bay only to discover that she was now a widow. It's not, while it's not clear how she ended her journey in Sacramento, two tales support a previous connection with the Hopkins family. There's a story that Patrick Nolan found work in Sacramento growing vegetables, and Mark Hopkins was a vegetarian with a passion for fresh vegetables. Another story claims that Mrs. Nolan and Mrs. Hopkins were distantly related. Catherine Nolan did find employment with the Hopkins family in Sacramento, 
but it's not clear why the Hopkins accepted the three-year-old Timothy into their family and apparently were not as accepting of the six-year-old Thomas. After seven years of employment with the Hopkins family, Cat Caroline married Henry Francis Marston in 1869. Marston, a native of Wales, was a pioneer farmer in Yolo County across the Sacramento River. He may have worked for Hopkins or was a fruit grower who sold produce to the Hopkins household where the recently widowed farmer met the widow Nolan. Caroline Nolan Marston went to live across Sacramento River in Yolo County with her eldest son, Thomas, her husband, Henry, and his two children. Four more children were to be born of this couple. And we'll come back and visit them a little bit later. Mark Hopkins was the oldest of the big four business associates and had a very different personality than the other three. Huntington, Crocker, and Stanford were all big men, well over 200 pounds. Hopkins was a very small, thin man, um, and he was very careful in financial matters, whether it was his money or the railroad's money. Some would say he was a cheapskate. <laughs> and unlike his business partners, he did not enjoy spending his wealth on lavish estates, fast horses, or fine, expensive art. Growing up in the Hopkins home in Sacramento, uh, Timothy became familiar with Leland and Jane Stanford. He was nine years old when Leland Jr. was born in Sacramento in 1868. In 1873, the railroad's corporate headquarters moves to San Francisco. Crocker and the Stanfords build large residences on top of Knob Hill. Mark Hopkins is content with a modest rented home at the bottom of the hill where his hobby is trying to raise grow vegetables in the cool weather and sandy soils of San Francisco. In 1878, the sickly Mark Hopkins dies in Arizona at the age of 60 while on a train seeking a warmer climate. He died without a will, and while the estate went to his widow, a series of legal battles and questions arose over who was who, what was what. These legal battles would face his estate and his family, including Timothy Hopkins, for the next 90 years. Mark Hopkins' death and some health issues of his own disrupted Timothy Hopkins' plans for college. A college education in a fine eastern college did not materialize. He went to work for the Central Pacific, later the Southern Pacific Railroad, and eventually became the railroad's treasurer. Years later, his work as a Stanford University trustee and his financial contributions to Stanford would resemble those efforts of other college alums showing the support for their old alma mater. Mrs. Mark Hopkins formally adopted Timothy Hopkins, uh, who was 20 years old at the time, in 1879, following the death of her husband. So Timothy Hopkins, Timothy Nolan Hopkins, was never, in a sense, related to Mark Hopkins. This is Mrs. Mark Hopkins. He, uh, Timothy Hopkins assumed the responsibility for managing her vast wealth. As the young wife of Mark Hopkins, Mary Hopkins was a well-educated -edu woman but had, was very ignorant of financial matters. She was now one of the wealthiest women in America and Timothy's financial management maintained her financial security as she began to spend the vast Hopkins fortune. There's always been some confusion with Timothy Hopkins' relationship with the Hopkins. It would appear that many people at that time, including journalists, reported um, were not clear about his real origins. There were numerous references to him as the son of Mark Hopkins, none of which were based on, um, which were based on erroneous assumptions by authors that he indeed was the son. The fact was she legally adopted him after Mark Hopkins' death only confused some of these stories. Mary Kellogg Crittenden, named, known as May, was the niece of Mary Frances Sherwood Hopkins. So we have two Hopkins, well, she's not married yet, she's about to get married. We'll, we'll have two Hopkins women with the same name, Mary Hopkins. Um, but um, she was born in 1863, so she was four years younger than Tim, 
and she had been educated in Europe, and following her mother's death in 1877, she traveled to San Francisco to visit her aunt. She met Timothy, and they were wed in November of 1882. Mary Hopkins was the aunt and the mother-in-law of the newly wed Mrs. Timothy Hopkins, or Mrs. Mary Hopkins. The widow, Mrs. Hopkins, through Jane Stanford's brother, Ariel Lathrop, uh, bought a nearby estate in 1883 as a wedding gift for the young couple. She named it Sherwood Hall. She paid $200,000 for the 280-acre estate. The, the estate included the lands that are today the Menlo Park Civic Center, SRI International, residential properties extending to San Francisco Creek, and the former home of Sunset Magazine. Milton Latham, who had been the former owner, had developed the property. He was briefly the governor of California in 1860, long enough to arrange his appointment as one of California's US senators five days later, and uh, went off to Washington. Years later, he had suffered some severe financial setbacks and before he died in 1882. Following his death, there was an auction of the estate's horses, carriages, and equipment. William Sharon, John T. Doyle, and Leland Stanford were among the neighboring property owners who bid on items. Leland Stanford had begun his peninsula land purchases in 1875, and his Palo Alto stock farm a horse operation acquired items from the Latham estate. By 1884, both the Stanford family and the young Hopkins couple are living in San Francisco with Peninsula Estates on, alongside San Francisco Creek. The two couples are more than business associates. Although a generation apart in age, they are friends. The Stanford biographer Norman Tudoro reports that May Hopkins was one of the few people whom Jane Stanford ever addressed by her first name in a letter. The young couple often, tra often traveled with the Stanfords, including trips to Monterey, New York, and Europe. And the death of Leland Jr. in 1884 changed the life of both couples. We're familiar with the Stanford's decision to memorize, memorialize their son with the creation of the university, but Timothy and May's life were also significantly altered by his death. Leland Stanford asks the 26-year-old Timothy Hopkins to be one of the founding members of the Stanford University Board of Trustees in 1885. While I'm sure that Leland had confidence in Timothy's abilities to contribute to the development and management of the new university, I can't imagine that he could have foreseen the significant contributions in numerous areas that Timothy made over the next 50 years. Leland and Jane were the parents of the new university, creating, funding its development. But it was Timothy Hopkins who was truly the university's godfather, constantly monitoring, nurturing the school, its students, and its staff for the next 50 years. One of his earliest contributions to the new university was the establishment of a new college town. Every college needs a college town to provide those non-academic services to students and staff. Mayfield, the town on the southern border of the new campus, was an obvious choice. Established in the 1850s, it was an economically viable community serving the needs of nearby farmers, ranchers, and lumbermen in the hills to the west. But the workers in those endeavors supported 13 saloons and two breweries. <laughs> While Leland Stanford was far from a temperate man, he was, after all, the world's largest wine grape grower, he saw the advantages of a dry university community, both to limit alcohol abuse by students, but also to appease the parents of prospective students. He asked Mayfield to consider becoming dry, and the community's economic analysis was that local business model was a proven success and the university was not a sure thing. <laughs> Following Mayfield's refusal to go dry, Leland asks Timothy to develop a new town on the eastern edge of the university. With a loan backed by Leland, Timothy Hopkins purchased 697 acres of land from Henry Seal and another 40 acres from the Soto Greer family. 
He plotted the streets of University Park, named the names which were pulled from his Menlo Park Estates Library. There was a bias toward literary names with some exceptions. Kellogg was named for Mrs. Hopkins' family, and Alma was named for a family friend. Leland Stanford had assumed that the new town would, would be named Men a Palo Alto, but a real estate developers in Mayfield had taken that name for a new subdivision. When Leland found out, he got his, his legal guys to work on it, and he recaptured his name for the new town, and the Mayfield subdivision was renamed College Terrace. The deeds to property in the new town were contained a restriction prohibiting the sale or manufacture of alcohol. Residents were permitted to have alcohol to consume it, but they could not purchase it in a town liquor store or saloon. It was legal to bring alcohol into the town, hence this, the tale of the Southern Pacific station master informing an unnamed professor that his box of books was leaking and that he should <laughs> come to the depot and take care of it as sooner than rather than later. <laughs> Another alcohol-related story, if it wasn't true, it certainly was plausible, was a Palo Alto resident was feeling poorly and her doctor prescribed champagne as part of her treatment, her cure. Her, doc her husband did not have a bottle of champagne on hand, and of course he could not buy one locally, so he walked over the Bryant Street Bridge in the middle of the night and pounded on the door of Sherwood Hall. Timothy Hopkins was awakened and the husband demanded a bottle of champagne. <laughs> Timothy Hopkins provided him with a bottle from his cellar and went back to bed. <laughs> the development of Palo Alto was Timothy Hopkins' favor to Leland Stanford. He was not particularly interested in selling Palo Alto real estate. He would sell you a full block a half a block, a quarter block, as much as you could afford. Professorville was developed with and preferred by a number of Stanford professors who wanted a house in town rather than leasing land on campus or living in Mayfield. The neighborhood was preferred by many of the faculty members because as the bird flew or the professor walked or the professor rode his bike, it was the closest Palo Alto neighborhood to the core of the campus. Um, in later years, Guy Miller, who was our first historian here in Palo Alto, had correspondence with Timmy Hopkins about some of these early issues, and one of them was um, about the street names. And they're printed on the right is Timothy Hopkins' handwritten response to Guy Miller's inquiry about it, it, saying that he did select the names. And another question about when did El Palo Alto, the, the, the other tree trunk, fall? And it was his estimation of, uh, I think, 1885. Timothy Hopkins was generous with the new churches and congregations in town. As soon as they were organized and had the funds to build the church building, he would often donate a parcel of land to them. When he was ready to unload his remaining unsold properties, he sold the bulk of them to University Realty, a, the real estate firm owned by Alan Cranston's father and his business partner. Timothy Hopkins' last major involvement with Palo Alto was in 1907 when he realized he still owned some land in town, a large parcel um, on the edge of town. He owned the land between the, the side of uh, Palo Alto Avenue and the middle of the creek and not needing or perhaps not being able to sell it, he donated the land to the city. After many decades, the city formally dedicated the land as a city park, naming it Timothy Hopkins Park in 1971. While the main Hopkins resident was, residence was in San Francisco, they did spend time at Sherwood Hall. Especially in the summer months, when it was cold and foggy in San Francisco, the couple would live on the Peninsula Estate. Timothy Hopkins would catch the seven o'clock train up to San Francisco and return on an early afternoon train in time to tour his estate. Michael Lynch was hired, he was an Irish gardener who was hired in 1886 to oversee the estate's grounds. Lynch and Hopkins began to change the estate into a commercial nursery. The Sherwood Hall Nursery Company began marketing a variety of flowers for the San Francisco market. They were celebrated for their violets, 
Other flowers such as sweet peas, asters, and chrysanthemums were popular. Greenhouses were, initially, uh, were eventually constructed to grow flowers such as carnations. And this is a plot of his land with um, the seed company on the, the southern border, bordering the creek. It's a view of the, the nursery. By 1890, there were five acres of violets producing blooms for six months out of the year, 15 acres of sweet peas, 10,000 chrysanthemums, and over 150 varieties of roses. There were 10,000 carnations under glass, poinsettias, ferns, and bulbs were added. The nursery business required 200,000 gallons of water per day, which was drawn from a series of wells. It's another view of the nursery. Not a great view, but in the distance on the right, you can see El Palo Alto sticking above the horizon. The nursery business was labor intensive. The cut flowers that were shipped daily to San Francisco required a large staff. Hopkins began hiring Chinese laborers to cover some of his labor needs. Problems arose with local white laborers who protested the hiring of Chinese laborers. The problems was not so much with his staff, who actually were paid more than their Chinese co-workers, but rather with members of the local workforce who were not hired. Menlo Park had a chapter of the Anti-Cooley League, and he met with their members in 1886, but he refused their demands to fire his Chinese workers. In 1893, the Sherwood Hall Nursery became the Sunset Seed and Plant Company, no relation to Sunset Magazine. In 1893, the San Francisco Call newspaper describes Timothy Hopkins as the dominant cut flower business in San Francisco but things were about to change. The National Economic Depression of 1893 really hurt the business. Cut flowers were not an essential uh, purchase for most customers. With the drop in demand, the company was unable to pay salaries, but workers were able to continue to receive room and board. Times were tough, and there were not a lot of job options. In 1894, the white workers went on strike, and the nursery managers fired them. By 1898, the profits from the seed, Sunset Seed could no longer cover the estate's overhead. Timothy Hopkins sold his interest in Sunset to his manager, James Sproul, one of the guys listed here on this business card. Timothy Hopkins took an active role in many of the activities of the newly opened Stanford University. He was still an officer of the Southern Pacific, and in 1893, he arranged for a Southern Pacific's Pacific Improvement Company to transfer lands in Pacific Grove to Stanford for a marine research station. He had been impressed with a marine research facility in Naples, Italy, and promoted a similar facility on the Monterey Bay. The Pacific Improvement Company pr provided the land and constructed the buildings, but it was Timothy Hopkins who provided the funds for the equipment and an ongoing funding source for the researchers. He financially supported a Stanford expedition to Arizona to collect bird, reptile, and mammal specimens in 1892. He also purchased several collections of birds and animals, I'm assuming stuffed, uh, collected in the American Southwest for the zoology department. His support of the Stanford University libraries included the donation of the Hopkins Transportation Library in 1892 which was a collection, comprehensive collection of railroad and other transportation-related materials. Although it was his intent for the material to remain as a separate collection, the, the library university, university library eventually broke the collection apart and dispersed it amongst the, the rest of the collection. Years later, this treatment resulted in Hoover's putting stronger conditions on his collection's unity when he donated his war material to Stanford. I could go on with hours, maybe not hours, but a lot of story with numerous efforts of Timothy Hopkins to assist the young university with the gifts of money and time and energy over the years, but there's some other good stories to tell. Initially, the Board of Trustees did not have that much influence over the functions of the new university, but this began to change, first with Leland's death, death in 1893, and then Jane's in 1905. The parents of the university were no longer in charge, and the trustees were now in charge of the university's finances. 
When Jane died mysteriously in Honolulu in 1905, Timothy Hopkins traveled with Dr. Jordan to retrieve her body and perhaps protect the university's reputation. He was both a representative of the Board of Trustees and a good friend of Jane. The 1906 earthquake created problems for all parties in our story. Palo Alto suffered a little physical damage. Aside from a few buildings and numerous chimneys, the town was pretty much back to normal within a few months. The university, of course, experienced much greater damage with destroyed buildings and uh, would not reopen until the fall. Hopkins Sherwood Hall mansion was so damaged that uh, it would remain uh, empty until it was torn down in the 1940s. Timothy Hopkins suffered severe financial, personal financial setbacks as a result of the earthquake and fire in San Francisco. Much of his wealth was invested in San Francisco real estate. Many of his real estate investments either collapsed in the quake or burned in the fire, including his own home. It would take several years of recovery before his level of financial support for Stanford equaled previous efforts. In addition to his support of campus activities, Timothy Hopkins was involved with management and financial support for the Stanford Medical School in San Francisco. He developed a very good working relationship and friendship with Ray Lyman Wilbur, the dean of the medical school and future president of the university. In his autobiography, Wilbur acknowledges that Timothy Hopkins was not only a close friend, but like a father to him. Along with Wilbur, Dr. Tom Williams, and Fred Smith, Timothy Hopkins was an early member of the famed fishing camp group. That friendship, this friendship, and his, plus his wife's interest in medical care for children, led to the support for the Stanford Convalescent Hospital, home, excuse me, home. The, the, the couple were a big financial contributors to the con home for the rest of their lives and beyond, with a significant bequest in their estate. Timothy Hopkins is credited with the idea of using the old Stanford home on campus as a convalescent facility. In researching this talk, it's been my impression that Timothy Hopkins was a really good man. He was an accomplished businessman with successes in many areas. Over the years, he worked hard to make Stanford a great university, and he had friendships with many people who, were we able to go back and talk with them, would agree that he was a good friend. But, and there is always a but, his relationship with his adopted mother was not good, especially toward the end of her life. After Mark Hopkins' death in 1878, she began to spend his fortune extravagantly. She was generous with the wedding gift of the Sherwood Hall to Timothy and his bride, her niece. In the process, she also uh, was spending vast sums furnishing her San Francisco mansion. A young decorator was sent from New York in 1882 to advise her on the home's interior. Edward T. Searles, the 20, eight-year-old decorator developed a strong friendship with the 48-year-old widow. From the beginning, this is their home in San Francisco, from the beginning, Timothy Hopkins expressed his concern over this relationship. Her fortune was primarily based on Mark Hopkins' 25% interest in the Southern Pacific Empire, and he was her business manager. The widow proposed to the young Searles, and they were married in 1887. Timothy Hopkins was eventually written out of the will, although he continued to manage her business affairs, something that neither the new Mrs. Searles nor her new husband were qualified to do. The newlyweds spent most of their time in the East. They were spending lavishly on real estate, new residences, and furnishings. When she died in 1891, Timothy Hopkins and the rest of the world uh, learned that her entire fortune was to go to her husband. Timothy Hopkins contested the will, and on the first day of the trial, Searles was grilled by Timothy Hopkins' lawyers. People were waiting for the next day of the jury of the trial to find out what else would come out, but an out-of-court settlement was announced the next morning. Timothy Hopkins was to receive a settlement of somewhere between three and $10 million. The accounts vary on the amount. A sizable fortune, but nowhere near as much as he would have expected to receive perhaps prior to the appearance of Edward Searles. 
This is a picture of Edward Searles. Unfortunately, it's not the young man that, that I would like to have shown you the picture of. It's an older, mature man, but um, it's the best I could find. Uh, one of the outcomes of Mrs. Hopkins' romance and second marriage was that Collis Huntington was able to force out Leland Stanford as president of the Southern Pacific, since her voting power was now diverted, no longer influenced by Timothy's judgment. Most biographical sources do not mention Timothy Hopkins' birth mother after her time in Sacramento working for the Hopkins, nor mention his brother Thomas after his arrival in San Francisco in 1862. Caroline Fallon Nolan Marston continued to live in Yolo County. Her husband Henry died in Woodland in 1894 at the age of 64. She lived until 1903 when she died in Woodland and was buried in Sacramento. An obit mentions a $5,000 bequeath she received following the death of Mark Hopkins in 1878, which was a very generous gift to a former employee. It's not clear whether Timothy Hopkins had any hand in arranging this gift. I find no further mention of an interaction between he and his birth mother. His older brother, Thomas Nolan, continued to live in the Sacramento area for the rest of his life. He was, I wrote here, he was a petty thief and a drug addict, but I perhaps should say he was a drug addict and a petty thief. Uh, at, for most of his adult life. At one point, Timothy sent his brother to a sanatorium to try for treatment, but following his release, he returned to the old life. A San Francisco Call news story from 1897 reported that he had died from paralysis from opium while in a Sacramento prison cell awaiting trial for theft of a piece of garden hose. Serious crime, I guess, in those days. He was 31 years of age. In the 20th century, Timothy Hopkins managed his own financial affairs and watched over his beloved university almost until the day he died. In addition to his financial support, he was a very active board member, serving uh, terms as both president and treasurer. By 1910, he was one of only two original board members still serving, and soon thereafter, he was the only surviving board member for the rest of his life. This is a picture of the board plus some other guys, but it's a beautiful picture out there. Uh, I could talk a lot longer, but I won't, detailing the numerous examples of the financial support that Timothy Hopkins and his wife provided the university and the convalescent home over the years. An article in the Stanford Daily reported that his financial support for Stanford was greater than that of any individual. Donor gifts, of course, in the last 50 years may exceed his financial contribution, but in terms of value, his gifts can be still viewed as extremely significant. Timothy Hopkins died in January 1936 at the Stanford Hospital in San Francisco and was buried in Colma. Ray Lyman Wilbur, wrote a warm tribute to Stanford's godfather, and honorary pallbearers included Wilbur, Hoover, J.P. Mitchell, Fred Smith, and Dr. Tom Williams. His will made provisions for lifetime support for his widow and that most of his estate would go to Stanford upon her death. The will also passed to the university the right to enforce the deed restriction on all properties in the original University Park that banned the sale of liquor. To the best of my knowledge, neither Timothy Hopkins nor Stanford ever took back any real estate using this provision. Five years later, in 1941, his widow died and was buried next to him in Colma. With her death, much of their estate passed to either Stanford or the convalescent home. In October 1942, Butterfield and Butterfield conducted an auction of her estate, including material from both her home in San Francisco and Sherwood Hall in Menlo Park. Thousands of curious visitors toured the house home on Saturday and Sunday, and many returned to bid on items on Monday. Local residents bid on many of the smaller objects and furniture, but most of the furniture was oversized for modern houses with eight-foot ceilings. Hollywood studio Warner Brothers was a major bidder, trucking away 
antique furniture, and even parts of the building, all of which could be seen in period films for the, over the next 50 years. In 2009, Bonham's auction held an auction of Herger Brothers furniture from the Warner Brothers Studio warehouse. The studio refused to detail which movies each piece had been used, thus perhaps lowering their real value, but did acknowledge that the furniture had come from a 1942 Menlo Park auction conducted by Butter and Butterfield. Sherwood Hall, the main residence, was demolished, and the site was used by the Army during World War II as double hospital. Following the war, Stanford housed married students there for several years. Eventually, the 200 acres was divided up. The Menlo Park Civic Center with the, the gatehouse, the SRI, uh, and the former home of Sunset Magazine were all on the former estate, but most of the land went, was subdivided into homes and apartment buildings. Timothy Hopkins had a strange fascination for genealogy. He either researched or paid researchers to trace the family histories of both the Hopkins and the Kelloggs. He is credited as the author of two genealogy books, The Kelloggs in the Old World and the New, a three-volume title published in 1903, and John Hopkins and Some of His Descendants, published in 1932. I found nothing to suggest that he ever researched his own family history. Timothy and his wife were survived by their daughter, Lydia, who was born in 1887. There had been two previous children, but the children did not live very long. While Lydia was recognized by both of her parents, there's very little mention of her in newspaper accounts uh, of Timothy and Mary. There is an account of her attending Stanford University sporting events with her parents, but very little else. In 1917, she traveled to Europe for war work, going to Italy, leaving her jewelry with her mother. For most of her life, dogs were a significant part of her life. She was known as the successful breeder and trainer of show dogs, especially poodles. Following her father's death in 1936, there was an agreement with her mother that she was to receive $2,000 a month and have a home provided not to cost more than $57,000. A lot of money in 1936. With this settlement, she bought a home on Portola Road in Woodside where she built an extensive kennel for her dogs. Following her mother's death in 1941, she brought legal action against the estate to claim some artwork and jewelry from her mother's estate, and the suit was settled for $13,500, according to a 1942 Palo Alto Times article. In 1951, she was sued by a Palo Alto grocer for an unpaid bill of over $1,400. When three years later, a Redwood City butcher claimed a $5,500 bill, which a judge ordered to be settled for $4,500. She died in 1965 at the age of 77. It's interesting to note that she died in North Carolina without surviving heirs. In 1970, her estate was sued by three individuals from North Carolina, claiming to be the heirs of Mark Hopkins, who had been both her grandfather, sort of, and her great uncle. This suit was the third time, at least, in the, that persons from North Carolina had made claims on the estates of Mark Hopkins' descendants, including a claim in 1936 following Timothy Hopkins' death, claiming that Mark Hopkins was actually a bachelor and that his alleged wife was really his sister. They were indeed first cousins. It all goes back to 19th century Sacramento when there were allegedly two Mark Hopkins in, living in town. One was the Mark Hopkins of the Big Four, and the other was a felon from North Carolina <laughs> who, who was living in Sacramento, allegedly using the alias Mark Hopkins. The legal battles lasted as long as they did, in part because our Mark Hopkins died without a will, creating a legal opening for all of these claimants. The 19 legal, 1970s legal suit against her estate was thrown out by the courts and we have not heard from any of the claimants from North Carolina since. 
But that's maybe because there are no more Mark Hopkins heirs to go after. Lydia Hopkins was the last surviving descendant of Mark Hopkins and his unofficial son, Timothy Nolan Hopkins. I hope you've enjoyed hearing the story of Timothy Hopkins. I'd like to acknowledge three people for their contributions in my talk. Rocky Nyland, who a former classmate of mine from Tamalpais High School, shared her research into Hopkins' involvement with Stanford, especially reports from the Stanford Daily. Bo Crane followed up on a point of confusion and revealed the tip of the story of Timothy Hopkins' birth family's history, hidden until now for the most part. Discovering the research power of digital newspapers was awesome. And a thanks to my wife, Luana, who I also met at TAM back in the 1960s. As with most of my talks, she greatly assisted me with the images and their graphic appearance. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. Yes? Steve, can you tell a little bit more about Hopkins and uh, plotting the land in Tawak from Southern? Did all the money come from Stanford, or some of the money come from Stanford to buy that? And then, did they set up a land company that sort of sold the property, and Hopkins didn't live and wasn't involved in politics in Palo Alto, but only in Mineral Park? Can you just clarify all of that? <laughs> um, did, I, did any of you not get that question? Um, the, the story of, Mark, of Timothy Hopkins' involvement with Palo Alto. I'm not sure where the money came for the, to buy the land. I mean, he's buying raw land. We know that Leland Stanford backed the loan, but whether he actually gave the money or just guaranteed it, I'm not clear. And so, but he began selling the property. It was, it was him, and I don't think he had you know, a real estate company or anything working for him. And that's one of the reasons why I think he got out of the business as quickly as he did. Um, he was happy to find a realty company after, after Palo Alto was a going thing and going to make it. I think you know, a lot of people, obviously all the people in Mayfield, in the beginning thought, this town's not going to make it because this university's not going to make it. But obviously they did. <laughs> and then, you know, certainly by 1910, 1915, he's out of the picture in Palo Alto-wise real estate. Yes? So did your research take you into what happened to Ed, Edward Searles and his um, fortune and what happened, what, what he did with that? Yeah, the question is what happened with Edward Searles and his fortune? He, he died, I'm going to guess, a very happy man. Um, <laughs> I mean, he came to California just with it. He was a, an interior designer with a fascinating, fascination for furniture. And he just got, he was in the right place at the right time. He was, you know, a handsome young man. Um, there's stories about where his other interests were, but when he married her, they were very happy. And then she died and it was his money to spend. He gave a lot of it away to, not to Stanford. He, he did, he gave the house in San Francisco to the city of San Francisco. He gave several million dollars to a, a prominent university across the bay in Berkeley. <laughs> I heard that go bears. Uh, but um, yeah, he just, he, he just lived well for the rest of his life. Yes? Is it, is it true that Mark Hopkins is responsible for the SP Depot being way down in the third in Townsend and not downtown? Oh, the question is, is Mark Hopkins responsible for the SP Depot being at Third and Townsend, which now fourth and Townsend, rather than being downtown. I do not know. I don't know the history of how. I mean, it sounds like in terms of being cheap and not buying the cheapest land, he would think of something like it. But I, do, I didn't look into that. Do not know. That's a railroad question. Way in the back. A member of the staff in five year class was named Charles Shaw Field. Was there any link? I do not know. I don't know that name. Charles Kellogg Field. Oh, she says he was connected with Sunset Magazine. Sunset Magazine, of course, was a, an SP publication before it was sold, before the SP, when it was operating in San Francisco. But I don't know of any other connection between him and down here. He lived in Los Altos. He lived in Los Altos. Talked to her when 
We're finished. Laura, Laura can tell you more about that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The mansion in Sherwood Hall. I've heard that it was not very much damaged by the earthquake, but it was not restored because Timothy Hopkins' financial problems. Is that so? Well, it, th there was damage to it, but, uh, but perhaps, I mean, it's perhaps a little bit of both. I mean, obviously, his financial situation in March of 1906 was significantly better than it was in late April of 1906. And so that may have made the decision that these repairs to this building are not going to be made. He moved into the gatehouse, and he and his wife lived there when they came to Menlo Park for the rest of their life. Yes, in the front here. I can shed some light on that. Sherwood Hall was not damaged in the earthquake. It was the underground gas pipe lines that were ruptured during the earthquake. So now you have this huge, huge, big, cold house that did not have heat or light any longer. And he was so hit financially by the damage downtown in the city because of where all his business interests were located. It made way more sense to move okay. without Lydia, because she's already gone, uh, into the gatehouse. Okay, and for the use in the back, uh, briefly summarize that, is that saying that the house really wasn't damaged, but there was a gas line or something under the house or something, or leading to the house? It was gas, there was a, a, a powerhouse that fed gas to the mansion, and the okay. powerhouse was at the back of the estate. The underground lines underneath were ruptured by the earthquake. So, yeah, so, so it's a little bit of both stories, is, is, is that he did not have the resources at a time to make a repair that could have been made and then later on just didn't feel the need to it. Because by this time, also, he's not as involved with Menlo Park. Over to the left. I understand that uh, Sherwood Hall was auctioned off in 1942 and much of it went to the movie companies, but I, I'm also told that the structure itself was auctioned off for its wood because there was the a shortage of uh, minute lumber, so that's where a lot of that went. Well, uh, the question of what happened to Sherwood Hall, I mean, part, Warner Brothers bought a part of the building because they took off one of the towers or something, and it's people, if you go onto the web, you can find all references to all these movies that the furniture appeared and so, so forth in. But um, beyond that, I don't know. Way in the back. Do you have any uh, background on the relationship to David Starr Jordan? Uh, my understanding is that Jordan initially uh, had the thought for the Hopkins Marine Station, he being an ichthyologist. And uh, so the, the understanding that uh, Hopkins developed four years later comes as news. Well, yeah, the, the question is the relationship between whether Jordan had the idea for the Marine Station or Hopkins, it may be the same because it, it didn't happen four years later. It happened pretty much at the beginning of Stanford. Um, and yes, he was an ichthyologist, but it's also from what I've read that Hopkins was impressed with what he saw. He had the ability to make the connections with Southern Pacific to get the land, and that's what he did. So they. they they obviously work together. And remember, he's on the board of trustees. Jordan is their number one employee. Yes? The, the, Bob? Oh. the first site of the Hopkins Brain Station was in a different place from it, where it is now. Slightly different, yes. But still in the, in the basic area. Yeah, but from China Point to uh, Yes. It, it was moved later. Yes? You said that the, the, the Sunset Seed Company had nothing to do with the magazine, but I mean, the, the, the eventual Sunset Magazine gardens were on the same, of course, on that same site, right? Well, that's true, but. Is but, but, the name of Sunset Magazine come from Sunset Seed Company? No, it can't. Well, Sunset Magazine was a, a PR arm of the Southern Pacific Railroad. It operated in San Francisco. It was primarily involved with incurring tourism. It had a literary angle to it. And then later, Southern Pacific wanted to get out of that business. And the Lane family bought it, operated it for a while there. And then I don't know whether it was karma or whether it was just pure happenstance that they ended up on land in the same property. But yeah, they, I don't think there was any relationship. 
Confirm, do you say that he was acting trustee from the first board until his death? Yes. 50 plus years, yeah. Oh, excuse me. The question is, was, was Timothy Hopkins indeed on the board of trustees for the whole time? He was one of the originals, and he served on until 1936. You know, I, I don't know for sure whether there, he resigned shortly before he died or something like that. I can't speak to that, but he was the whole time. Yes, behind, there. You mentioned that Searles gave his house to the city of San Francisco. G gave the Hopkins built a house, yeah, where, where the Mark Hopkins Hotel later ended up. So how, how did that happen? Did the city sell it? Well, the city, he gave it to them with the idea that it was going to be... No, no, I think it was... Well, I think no, I think that it ended up being an art school, but he wanted it to be music, some type of arts, and he gave it to them with that idea, and it, it slightly got altered, and then, well, I mean, it, I, no, I mean, how they used it, whether music versus art, but then in 1906, the building wasn't there anymore. So, one last question. Oh, we got one last question. The Sherwood horse at the Stanford Bar was a gift of Timothy. To Stanford in 1923, and you didn't mention that. <laughs> I, I told you I had lots of other stories I could go into. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.